the artist parent. This panel came about when Sarah Beth and I were at Enseca last year in discussing our passion for our significant others and our passion for our careers in clay, we found that we shared an anxiety over pursuing this duality. This conference hosts conversations on many topics, but we felt a more holistic conversation needed to be introduced and a community needed a chance to come together. We're excited to host a conversation on how personal life plays a role in making pivotal career choices. In this panel, we will share insight from both aspiring artist parents and from women that are currently artist parents. I also wanna note that while our panel is made up of women, the topics we'll be discussing today, we hope will have an overlap across both fathers and mothers. I'd like to start by introducing our panelists here today. Erin Ferensky is an artist and educator from Bloomington, Illinois, who focuses on the relationship of sculptural form and highly ornamented surfaces. She received a BFA from Pennsylvania State University and an MFA from Ohio State University. Ferensky has exhibited her work nationally and internationally. Next to Erin, we have Megan Cheney Gumpert. She works with low fire clay and glass and has been a resident artist at Aramont, the Clay Studio of Missoula, and Watershed. In 2009, she completed a post bac program at the University of Florida and now teaches workshops and maintains a private studio in Ocala, Florida. Sarah Beth Merritt is originally from Tifton, Georgia and received her BFA in ceramics from Georgia State University. She is currently making work out of her home studio in Decatur, Georgia, and her work is informed by Southern culture, nature, and the human condition. And I myself am Katie Bosley. I received my BFA from the University of Florida and currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. I've interned at the Archie Bray Foundation in Montana and Women's Studio Workshop in Rosendale, New York. I'm currently making work as a studio assistant at Colin Wald Fine Arts Center in Atlanta, Georgia. We're now gonna take a moment to tell you a little bit about ourselves. Because our panel is focused on the discussion portion, we will only briefly share our own personal work. Our slides, though, will be rotating throughout our panel, so you'll have a chance to record our contact information, and we are happy to hear from you if you have any more questions on that portion of our panel today. Like I said, my name is Katie Bosley. I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I work a full-time job as a studio coordinator and instructor at a children's art studio. I also teach locally uh, two adult clay classes at two different art centers outside of the city. I have my studio space through a work exchange at a local art center. I met my partner, Niels, while pursuing my BFA in ceramics. I, once I earned my degree, I moved around the nation pursuing clay opportunities. After nearly a year and a half of long distance, I decided to move to Atlanta to live with him. And coming on two years in the city, I'm now applying for long-term residencies where he will move with me. This is my work. I find beauty and repetition and symmetry. My surface decoration reflects my love of these things in art. And I use a combination of suspended interiors and exteriors to add to the depth and complexity of my work. Next, we're gonna hear from Megan Cheney Gumpert. Hi, I'm Megan. I currently live in Ocala, Florida. I met my husband in 2004 when I was a resident artist at Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. He was living in Florida and we met at a bar in North Carolina, a state in which neither one of us were living in. Um, we dated and did long distance for two years um, before getting engaged. At that time I was living in Asheville, North Carolina and told him I would not move to Florida unless there was a ring on my finger. I needed to know that I could support myself and, um, and that, that he was serious about it. So I moved to Florida three months before our wedding. Um, we will celebrate our 10th wedding anniversary next month. We now have two boys, ages four and six. Um, let's see, uh, my husband is an engineer for Lockheed Martin, and so I am able to split my time between raising our two boys and uh, working in a home studio. And that's how you can get in touch with me. <laughs> I 
And next, we're going to hear from Aaron Frinsky. Hi, I'm Aaron Frinsky. Um, I live in Bloomington, Illinois, originally from the East Coast, which is where I met my husband in undergraduate school at Penn State University. Um, it was love across the hand building table. There we are with our, ki our kids. Uh, we've been together going on 20 years now. Our oldest child just turned 11 and our youngest is seven. We have a studio at our house. We are both professors at a university and have a shared home studio. This is an example of my work. I make small scale, hand built sculpture that's surface intensive. Um, I investigate the overlap of decoration and its role in society. Um, and I've been <coughs> recently combining some found objects into my work. Here is an example of that. And here is my contact information. And I'd love you to follow me on Instagram. And you can see what I'm up to on a more timely manner than updating my website. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah Beth Merritt. And um, Katie and I uh, began talking about how we are both passionate about both our careers and our relationships and moving forward with that. Um, my fiance and I met uh, a little over two years ago at a going away party for my sister and my brother-in-law and we met through them. Um, he, we were both uh, just a year out of college and both pursuing our passions, his in writing and mine in ceramics. Um, and so, really making, making that jump in um, both my relationship and my career to progress. A little bit about your work? Um, during undergrad, I was doing more figurative work, and uh, since graduating, I've been pursuing pottery to be able to experiment with uh, the services and actually be able to finish work and find my voice in the As service. I said earlier, our slides will be rotating through, so we'll have some information on artist opportunities that are specific to artist parents, um, as well as some information about the community that we are trying to build. Some of you may have gotten our little buttons throughout the course of the week. Um, and we're just trying to build a support system for each other and come together and including those aspiring artist parents like myself that want to see that other people are out there and making it happen and that it's just all possible. <laughs> um, before I move on to the question portion, um, one of our goals with this panel is to build that community. Now that you know a little bit about us, we'd love to learn a little bit about the audience we have here today. By a show of hands, how many people here are aspiring artist parents that do not have kids yet, but that are hoping to pursue that route? Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> and now for current artist parents that we have in the audience. Great, thanks guys. So we wanna take just one more moment here to have a chance for you guys to learn a bit about each other. If you guys can turn to a neighbor or someone nearby and just introduce yourself and share what brought you to the panel here today. You guys know each other already. <laughs> I can cheating, tell. Cheating. That doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, He's not know. allowed to answer, ask questions. <laughs> I know. I didn't know if you were going to be like, and my husband is there. <laughs> so, all right. So, the last thing that we wanted to touch on before we started the question answer portion of our panel today is to make a quick statement here that our conversation is a chance to bring community together through our commonalities. We acknowledge that the perspectives that we can offer today here on this stage are limited to our unique experiences. We're asking going forward that everyone can come together with an open mind and create a judgment-free zone. We're here to create conversation as well as a community of support. 
And without further ado, we're going to start the question answer portion of our panel so we can hear from these fabulous women that I've got here with me today. My first question for today is, when did you realize you wanted to pursue a career as an artist? And when did you realize you wanted to be a parent? Erin, do you want to start us out? Sure. Um, first, I don't think it's really a choice sometimes to become an artist. I think that it just happens to you. <laughs> so I never um, imagined being anything else. And where there's more choice is the path and the planning um, to become an artist. Academics, risk-taking, residencies, finances, processing all of those things. Um, as for becoming a parent, I also knew I always wanted to be a mother, and I figured I would become one some way, somehow, at some point. Um, one thing I didn't know is when that would happen, and that was a little bit more difficult for me because I couldn't control that, and I'm very goal-oriented, and sometimes you can't control when you are going to conceive, and I had more difficulty with that. Um, and then another thing I felt confident with is knowing that I wanted two children. I have had a lot of friends that have had children and they go in this whole conundrum of whether to have two or three, what they can take on. And I'm not saying everybody feels this way, but I was very lucky to feel like I felt if I had another child, then I would lose my career. And I knew like I was at my, my max, so. <laughs> Uh, I would agree with Erin. I also, I don't know that I ever considered any career other than being an artist. Um, it took on several different forms, whether or not I was going to be doing applied design or ceramics or sculpture, but I knew in some way I, was, I wanted to be an artist. Um, and then same thing with being, a, with being a mother. It was more of a question, uh, more of a matter of, well, when and how does this fit in with, uh, with my lifestyle and with other goals. So. And, um I can relate to both of you in that I knew I always wanted to be an artist and it wasn't until college that I realized I wanted to pursue ceramics specifically as a career and um, uh, I've always known I wanted to have kids also um, and it's a discussion that I have with my fiance and you know uh, it's just a matter of time you know like when like three years five years you know figuring that out. For our next question, before you met your significant other, what were your career goals? Did they change once you were in a relationship? And specifically, Megan and Erin, I'd love to hear your perspective on this now. Sure. Um, before I met my significant other, I would say my career goals were sort of twofold. I wanted to create um, unique, one-of-a-kind sculptural work um, for exhibitions, galleries, private collectors, corporate collections, that sort of thing. And then I'm also uh, interested in having a production line of more design-based work uh, to sell and market online. Uh, since meeting my significant other and having kids, I wouldn't say that those goals have necessarily changed. Um, I've just learned to change the timeline a little bit. I sort of like the analogy of, you know, you're cruising along on a straight road and I had these goals, I had this direction of where I was going. And with choosing family and um, career, I just sort of took an exit, and now I'm sort of taking the winding route, though the destination hasn't necessarily changed. I can relate in the same way. Um, I still have the same goals I had before I met Alex, but as to how I'm going to achieve those goals has shifted. So before, I was really open to going um, to a residency, if it was in Montana or Australia. I didn't really feel rooted in one place, but um, after, you know, starting a relationship with him, my interest in that shifted and I felt more rooted in, in Atlanta and um, more settled in one place. So as for my career goals um, personally and then how they shifted after I met my partner, uh, I thought about this question a lot and I thought about, well, what is a career? So I Googled it um, <laughs> and I came up with uh, an occupation undertaken for a significant period of a person's life and with opportunities for progress. So I thought about that and what is, what is progress? And all these things are so individual and um, unique to each person. So for me, my personal career goals, I boiled it down, I felt were threefold. I wanted to be financially stable. Um, two, as for a career, I really wanted to contribute to the field of ceramics and the greater art community out there. 
And three, I wanted to create art that was truly authentic to me. Um, I wanted to be challenged daily in the studio and make what I wanted to make. Um, so was that going to lead, was making what I want to make going to lead to financial security and a career? I wasn't really sure. Um, luckily, it has to some degree. Um, and I don't make a lot of work that has a lot of sales, but for my career, making what I wanted to make led to other opportunities, workshops, teaching, um, a DVD, so ways of making that financial security happening. Um, and how has my career shifted with my spouse? Um, we knew that one of us was going to probably go into academia. So which one would be played out, but I felt like as a couple we decided we needed that security of a monthly paycheck. Um, we also liked that you could get that and the summers off, um, and you could get insurance. So uh, when we had that, my husband got it first, so then I, um, I'm teaching ac um, adjunct mostly. So. The next question is something that I'm particularly interested in hearing as an early career artist that's moving towards the path of a family and an artist's career. Um, can you share any fork in the road experiences, um, decisions that you've made, and how you feel about them now? While I'm not um, a parent yet, uh, I feel like I'm working through a fork in the road now. Uh, until December, I had an assistantship like Katie at Calumwell Fine Arts Center, which is a work exchange. You work six hours a week in exchange for access to the studio and materials. And I chose to leave um, three months early because I, would, I had just taken on too many things. I was working my full-time job in a small batch ceramic studio, um, a gallery on the weekend, and the six hours became more of like a task that I just showed up and did, and I wasn't able to utilize the studio time. So shifting that into a home studio and uh, getting into a new routine of making myself go into my basement versus, um, you know, the Calumwell community. I would say for me the, the biggest, most specific fork in the road would be while I was at the University of Florida doing a, a post back, and I had to decide whether or not I was going to pursue my MFA or start a family. Um, I would say what contributed to that decision um, were, were several things. One, I was already married. My husband is a little older than me, and he was already ready to start a family. And we were also rooted and very much living in, in a city where we were unable to move. So I, I, the option of having us relocate so that I could you know, be part of an MFA program wasn't really an option for me. So um, we picked family, and I was pregnant before I finished my post back program. <laughs> Ready or not. <laughs> yep. I think a lot of people encounter many similar fork in roads, like do you do the long distance relationship or where do you go to school? These are common things that you will encounter on your ceramic path often. So uh, one that was a little more unique to me and really my biggest decision was that my husband is a full-time professor at Illinois State University, and for two years I taught their full-time non-tenure track. And the position came up to go um, tenure track, which typically people would be like, wow, that's an ideal world, both of you could do that. But at the same point, we worked 12-hour days, opposite days. Um, we talked about work at home all the time, and I just felt like we needed a little bit more separation, and I wanted to have, well, we wanted to have a second child at the same time. So the school had to ask me, are you applying for the job? I couldn't even be like, well, I'll see how this plays out. They said, are you applying for the job because your husband has to completely remove himself from any sort of relationship to the the conversation about who's going to be hired or he's going to chair the committee. So it was a decision that was really hard that I had to make and I chose to not go for the job um, really just for balance. I was very happy teaching full-time non-tenure track but throwing on all of that search committee and all of the pressure to show which I did really anyway. I just felt like I couldn't do that and have another child at the same time. 
So it was hard to turn down, or at least I'm one to go for an opportunity. It was hard to not go for it. How do you feel about that now, Erin? I feel like it was the right thing. I, I feel like now, with my children being a little bit older, that I could navigate the daily routine. But at that moment, and this is also you know, my personal way of parenting, um, having the job could have afforded the full-time childcare, but I also, I just couldn't see myself with a six-week-old baby walking in and being like, I'll see you later. Like, it just, like, I, I kept picturing that, and I just didn't, it didn't sit well with me. And I was content with having less money and more time with my children and flexibility. And like I said, I still teach. I still kept doing that, but not full-time. Thank you. What have some of your greatest challenges been as an artist parent, and what is something that you are currently struggling with? This is more for Erin and Megan. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, managing time. <laughs> and, and just how much time are you, you know, are you, how much time are you a parent? How much time are you in the studio? And, and how to make those hours the most, um, the most efficient. And also um, expectations, knowing when to say no to opportunities that might not be in line with your goals or in line with um, where you're trying to go, and I also have learned to um, to really protect my studio <clears throat> hours. Um, I have only get so many hours a week in the studio, and that's when I try to be there. This uh, past year, I, my both of, well, I have a little bit of time in the morning because our youngest is in preschool, but I, I opted to t give sort of Friday off. I call Friday, or they're my flex Fridays. So if a friend wants to meet me for coffee or I serve on several local art boards um, or if I have a meeting or anything, I will only do those on Friday so that Monday through Thursday I'm in the studio and I, I, I just don't take up that time. So that's, I would say, how I've managed, uh, managed that time a little bit. I also would agree with um, time and guilt probably, but as for time, anything that you can do with your child you do it with your child. So when they are sleeping or when your spouse or a family member can help out, you go directly to the studio. You don't pay a babysitter to clean your house. Um, you figure out how to clean your house with your kid. You go grocery shopping with your kid. I'm a long distance runner. My kid has run thousands of miles with me. <laughs> and um, if they would fall asleep, I would turn around, run home, put the stroller in the studio and just start working in my running clothes. <laughs> um, and as for time also, there is a different way of time with a child's needs. When they need something or they're having a hard time, you have to address that immediately. And it is very easy, even though clay is a time sensitive material, a human being is way more time sensitive. And it's, um, you can ignore a piece, but you can't, uh, ignore a crying child so you um, you just walk away and the thing that gets shelved is often the studio you know I have to show up for work if I'm an hour late for going to the studio nobody's gonna notice I'm gonna get in big trouble if I'm an hour late for teaching so yeah and to continue on some of those same topics you guys have been discussing we know that artists parents often struggle with feelings of guilt that studio can take away time from the family and vice versa. How do you manage these feelings of guilt? Oh, guilt. Um, Aaron, you want to? Yeah. Well, my husband likes to say I'm the guiltiest non-Catholic he's ever met. <laughs> um, so I get guilty about a lot of things. Um, but I've gotten a lot better with it. I think you feel less guilty. If you have a small child, or a toddler, infant, it is so intense in the beginning and things are changing so quickly. Um, and that guilt is strongest then. I think it starts to alleviate as they get a little older. The challenges are different. Um, and in my opinion, uh, knowing and making a schedule and knowing when you're going to be a, an artist and knowing when you're going to be a parent um, is great and I sometimes if I'm around the studio or around the house and I'm with the kids the guilt is stronger so for me I feel better if I just go places for us to have good family time since we're both artists sometimes we just have to travel um, not saying that we have all this money to spend doing but we'll be like okay let's go camping so we will not 
be tempted to give our attention to other things. Um, and also for guilt, you have to figure out how to manage it, and it can be very intense. So a little story about that is uh, at one point we had our studio in the basement and I was down there and I would have to fake leave because the toddler did not comprehend, didn't understand, even if I said, I'm going to work. So I would leave and I would go out the front by and go back in the basement. I could hear my husband upstairs and they were having a really hard time. I knew the child wanted to nurse and they're both struggling and I felt so guilty and I couldn't go up and then and I like, held my ground and then I got really hungry and thirsty and I couldn't even go upstairs to get something to eat and drink <laughs> and I'm like this is ridiculous so I'm like texting leave some water and pretzels at the top of the stairs <laughs> and, and then like, I hear him stomp like that means it's delivered <laughs> and I run and I get it and I was just like this is all like ridiculous and I Whatever was like, is it worth it? Work, right? <laughs> but yeah. you get through it. Now, um, you touched a little bit on really compartmentalizing and setting that time aside. And I know mm -hmm. that, Sarah Beth, despite the fact that you don't have kids yet, yeah. that's something that you still deal with in your relationship. Yeah, now. we both work a lot. And so designating that one night a week to, that you know you have that quality time allows you to separate. And for me, it allows me to be like mentally present at both and physically present when that time to get yeah. the most out of our time together. What yeah, you, I could just reiterate what they're saying. I've, I've learned to, comp to compartmentalize. I, studio time, I try to be very focused on what I'm doing in the studio. Um, I'm a morning person, so it works that I get that done in the morning. And then I know that I'm going to pick my child up at noon, and we're going to have seven hours together in the <laughs> afternoon. So I don't feel guilty about the two and a half hours that I'm getting in the morning, because we have a large chunk of the day where I can really focus on them. Um, and then I also designate all my evenings for, for the business side of things. So I don't worry about that while I'm in the studio. I do that um, separate. So yeah, it's planning. You have to, yeah, just lots of. I think we <laughs> also have to remind ourselves that um, working and having a career is making us a strong role model. Um, so if you are not spending all of your time with your child, it doesn't mean you want to train them and you want them to see somebody focusing on themselves because you hope they do that for them, their own selves as they grow. So, doing something that we love, you mm -hmm. know, teaching them to follow. And I'm a nicer person after I've worked in a studio. <laughs> yes. Aren't we all? Do you ever feel, um, do you ever have feelings of anxiety over choosing a career path that is known for being less financially lucrative? If so, how do you balance these feelings and work that into your relationship dynamic? Yes, I, I definitely did early on in the relationship with my husband. Um, even just from when we met and when we were dating, I knew that there was a huge um, gap in our income structure. Like I mentioned, my husband's an engineer. Um, and so for, and then after we got married in the early years, I was still always very conscious and very aware, but I would say what helps the most is just to have those open conversations with your partner. And he told me at one point he didn't care what I did if I wanted to work at McDonald's and it made me happy that it would be fine. So just, again, communicating that and being um, open with one another so there, doesn't, there aren't any feelings of resentment or that you aren't contributing. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you touched on that because that's something that moving forward with my relationship is um, like Alex and I have had this discussion, you know, he uh, eventually, you know, we're 50-50 right now, but eventually he wants to be the sole breadwinner. And um, growing up being taught to be independent and to be able to support myself, I kind of feel a, a certain sense of reluctance in allowing him to take on that responsibility because I don't want to feel like I'm not, you know, holding up my end of the relationship. So as for having anxiety about choosing a career path that is less financially lucrative, I actually just have more anger that the career path that we are doing is not <laughs> valued and lucrative. <laughs> um, so I just feel frustrated that our culture and our society doesn't support what I think is extremely valuable and integral to a healthy society and also that we don't have as much support on the domestic home front of uh, subsidized child care and different things and support systems in that way. So um, I just get more frustrated about the system than have anxiety about it. 
So to move on to some questions about your studio practice. In what ways, um, Aaron and Megan, a question for you, in what ways have you tweaked your studio practice since becoming a parent? Um, well, lots of things have changed. Everything changes when you have a child. Um, and some real quick things that I would say is your sense of productivity changes and you realize you can get a heck of a lot done in a short amount of time <laughs> if you just go in and you get down to business. Um, I also, um, and Sarah will say the same thing, I, I couldn't handle the emotional, um, the emotional distraught, distress I felt when I would lose a larger piece that I spent a lot of time on. So I had to take a break of, and shift my objects that I was making, and one of them is an example up here, the pink piece, so I made smaller, tiny pieces, so if I lost something or something didn't go right, I could make another, and I was making lots of little pieces and working more as a collage style, and then mounting it on wood instead of making a larger scale piece. Um, so I made smaller, more flexible work. Um, I also do work at night, and I enjoy working at night, and, but I set up the type of work I do at night to be something that's not a lot of decision making. It's labor, it's repetitive, it's meditative, and I have my time where I'm fresher at some point during the day, and I don't have the children to make decisions, and I set myself up for later on being productive. Um, and these are just some logical things that you can do to help yourself. And I know, uh, Megan, you've touched on some of your pieces being smaller pieces and working mm -hmm. that into the time as well. Yes, I learned to just work smaller. Uh, I've also started doing more slip casting for the production work that I do to try to um, make the most out of my studio time. Uh, and then uh, there are times since my children are getting older where they'll actually will join me in the studio. So adjusting to having two um, helpers around <laughs> has been um, good and bad. I, I never wanted the studio to be a place, or I don't want the studio to a place that's like, no, you're not allowed in here. I want them to, to be able to come in and enjoy making and enjoy that process, but learning to make alongside of them um, has changed. And I, I believe this was talked about yesterday in the panel. Someone asked about um, having children in the studio as far as um, safety. safety with children. Yeah. Um, I personally never had my kids in the studio when they were really young. They put everything in their mouth. Um, so I just, I wasn't comfortable with having them in there. But now that they're older, they're four and six, they can be out there with me. And they, I actually have a video on my Facebook page of what it looks like when they come and help and set up <laughs> obstacle courses with popsicle sticks and drying racks. And you just learn to, to work alongside the chaos. Um, and Two things that I found were helpful. Um, I didn't bring my infant into the studio very much. It just wasn't what I wanted to do. If I did, uh, I wore them on a, in a backpack instead of a front carrier so you could move around and um, be more um, able to do what you need to do. And the second thing just slipped my mind. So oh, I thought of another tip that I, uh, damp boxes have been huge for oh, helping yeah, me. Yeah. Um, since my gaps between studio time are so long and clay is so time sensitive, I can put something in a damp box and if someone wakes up in the morning with a fever and it's four days before I can get back in the studio, I know that that work will still be at a point where I can work on it. So I love those. I actually remember what it was, um, <laughs> is setting up a space that is for your child, their work area. And it's a, it's a table, it's a small table, it's a rolly table, like I can use it. But um, I, when they come in, I'm like, don't touch my stuff. Here's your tools. Here's your table. And then they feel more empowered and they are, it can make a mess or do whatever they want in their own studio space. Yeah. Addressing creative play in the studio. We all know that limited studio time can often limit an artist's creative play. How do you preserve the ability to allow yourselves to, rate, to take risks in studio? And Sarah Beth, again, despite not having kids yet, it's something that working a full-time job and balancing yeah. a studio that you yeah. can comment on as well. So, again, trans so I'm transitioning from Callenwald, a larger community center, to having my own studio basement space. And the when I work um, a full day 
at making someone else's work, essentially, I don't always want to come home to make my own stuff. So I've found that like once I make myself go down there and I make something that wasn't, you know, slip cast and it wasn't, I didn't have to make it over and over again because I work in a production studio, I feel a, a sense of freedom that I was like, oh, I needed this. You know, it's like, it's like therapy. You've been, it's like an itch that you needed to scratch and it feels productive. <laughs> Do you have any tricks or tips that you use to use that time wisely or to uh, make sure that you still experiment and get creative? Is there a way Like philosophy? some of uh, uh, what you touched on before and getting um, maybe change, um, prompts, you know? Changing. Well, for, for me, yeah. When I'm at home, sometimes I don't take as many risks because I'm like, okay, there's a show deadline, changing there's this setting, going yeah. on. So changing your setting, and um, I've done a number of residencies. I've done them with my children. I've done them without them. I've done them while seven months pregnant. And uh, that, I, when I'm at a residency, I allow myself to play. I don't go to a residency to make a show. So yes, I'm not going on um, year-long residencies, but if I know I'm going to have two weeks, like I am going to have this summer at Red Lodge, kid-free with other mothers that are makers, I'm like so excited to just do whatever I want and really let my creativity fly there. Um, and also in my studio, I don't take a lot of risks on my actual pieces. I will build a larger form, and I'm constantly working on little tiles and playing and doing surface work, and I have a test kiln and that was one of my best purchases. So I could like pop little things in and out and get feedback and like there's no risk, their time is quick, it's not money on electricity and yeah, it's, yeah. it frees you up. So for me, creative play has taken on a whole different media. I've recently picked up photography and I'm really enjoying, um, enjoying that. So I'm able to do that while I'm with my children and I am constantly stalking them with the camera. <laughs> And so while I'm able, I'm not only collecting these images of, of our life and our little day to day, but I'm also finding that it's making me more present and I'm noticing the light and the shadows. And so I'm finding that it's informing my, my studio practice as well. Um, and then I'm also practicing and then using those photos a lot of times for business or shows or applications. So that for me, I was unexpected to pick up a whole different, you know, avenue, but. I, and I'm, I also work with scrapbook paper I mean, a lot of it's just like crafty, like do-it-yourself projects um, for like Christmas gifts and whatnot. But I really enjoy pattern and um, getting inspiration from these different, like multiple patterns and how they fit together and color palettes and that kind of thing. I think we sometimes, um, there, I've done a little bit of reading on it about what is important creative play and what is important creative work and sometimes we have to allow ourselves some flexibility with it and where those little creative moments can come in in other ways i mean it could be simply that the um and it like the patterns and the colors and the laundry you've just folded but you have to slow down and be aware of those mundane things that can actually be quite inspirational and beautiful um, would you like to share how you motivate yourself to go to studio when you're spent from a day of parenting or even from a day of work? So when, you know, when you have an infant and a toddler, it is, you're exhausted and usually it's very, it's very hard to motivate yourself to want to go out there. Usually you just want to crawl in bed and sleep because you're so sleep deprived you can't see straight. But um, I would say for me when they were very young, what motivated me is I had, um, a babysitter arranged to come two afternoons a week for two hours at a time. So I was already had a schedule and was paying this woman to be there. So because I was already paying her, that was motivation enough for me to just get out there and get get going. And, and, and inevitably, whether the babysitter was there or my husband was with the kids, once you get to the studio and just get into it, you get the ball rolling. And, and usually it it just sort of works works out. For me, if I set up, like, um, if I sign up to do, like, a, a holiday show or something that I have a deadline that I'm working towards, um, I, you know, that sense of guilt kind of kicks in, like, oh, I need, I need work for this thing. And so even if, um, you know, making myself do things like that or 
forces you to set kind up of, goals to yeah. work forward. Yeah, yeah, that's a great thing. So deadlines are always a kick-ass motivator. <laughs> um, another thing that motivates me is, first, I just want to say I think artists are always motivated. We would never be here if we weren't motivated and are super hardworking. Um, and my husband motivates me because if one of us is going to the studio and the other one is like, oh, I was going to answer these emails and do that, and you're, it's real easy to be like, oh, I'll do that later, and we go to the studio. So we go to the studio at night a lot, even on a Saturday night. You know, you have a bottle of wine and you put on stupid comedy and you work in the studio, and then it's like a fun Saturday night. Um, so another thing to motivate is I think a support network is crucial if you have family members that can help and they recognize that you really need that time in the studio or if you have, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be, even though I'm in a small community, I have numerous other mother artists that are around there and we had children around the same age and for two years straight we set up a shared childcare situation and we would pick each other's kids up and like take them from preschool and stuff and when we left we'd be like, wait, be like, bye, go to the studio, don't you dare go to the grocery store and like <laughs> You, when somebody gives you time designated to go to the studio, you should be grateful and honor that and not do something else. Megan, isn't that something that you did as well? Uh, yes, I'm doing that more now. I didn't when they were young, but I have um, another parent, a father actually, and he's a metal worker and a photographer. And we, we do sort of an exchange. I'll watch his two kids some days, and he'll watch mine some days if we have to do meetings or work if there are deadlines. So it's nice to sort of find that community and and pull together. If you can find it, it's phenomenal. I mean, you yeah. have to navigate a lot of things, parenting styles, things like that, but um, try to seek it out. Yeah. Our next question, how do you define success as an artist, and how do you define success as a parent? So, I guess for me this can be taken in stages. I feel like there is the, the this overall idea of career success, recognition, awards, selling work, um, or with parenting, raising healthy, happy, well-adjusted human beings. Um, and then there's the the day-to-day -day success, like, awesome, I made enough work to finally fill this kiln and it can fire it. And I made it to the end of the day without yelling at my children. You know, like, that's, you know, the definition of success can be, can vary and is, and is individual. And I agree. I think this is an incredibly deeply personal question. Um, not that I'm saying that I'm, I can't answer that, but I cannot speak for others. Um, and so for all of you aspiring um, mothers and parents out there that want to be makers, you have to define success openly. And there can be many factors that come up and create obstacles along that way too. Um, so I can only speak from my perspective, and so success for me um, first comes from making what I feel good about and what challenges me and keeps me engaged. And so that gives me a sense of internal fulfillment, like that's most important to me. Um, and then because I did that and I was succeeding at it, um, the work was good enough to give me the external success things like shows, opportunities, and um, I mean, those things felt really good, and sometimes it, it sometimes you need them, um, but we have to remind ourselves to like first find that fulfillment within ourselves. So uh, I do think it's important to get out there on a grander scheme, though, so we keep having role models. Uh, so that one picture of me up there, pregnant, I remember that was on the In Ceramics Monthly, and that was years ago. And I remember them contacting me, and they were doing this story on me. And I was like, I'm like, like nine months pregnant. And, and, I, and then I thought, you know what? I definitely want to do this photo and do this right now because I am nine months pregnant. And so um, it's important to get out there for your success and for the success of others that will follow you. And I think success is really, you know, individual like they've stated before. So for me, it's finishing something sometimes, even the li finishing the littlest project um, and, you know, when you put in the time in something or you spent the extra hour, like, painting the tiny design and it, you know, it turns out the way you were hoping it would, it, 
that feels like success to me. And um, I don't have children yet, but you know, I hope to raise like happy, productive, um, <laughs> d you know, confident in themselves. Little people. Little people, <laughs> yeah. There you go. But that, that parenting is such a dance, it's not always up to you. I mean, they come into this world mm -hmm. how they are, <laughs> um, and it's more like you're guiding them. Everyone um, has surprising gifts and challenges, and those ebb and flow as you go. And sometimes the balance is there, and sometimes it isn't. You just kind of have to persevere through those times. Our next question, just for a little bit of fun here, I'm wondering if you guys have any um, interesting anecdotes or stories of, of the life of an artist parent that you'd like to share with the crowd? Get a, a spray bottle. <laughs> the kid will just stand there with a spray bottle for like two hours spraying things in, in the, the studio. studio. <laughs> and it honestly, you, you're like, if I probably added up the time that I worked because of a spray bottle. Yeah, it's so. nice. Let's um, see. How are we doing? Like just an anecdotal story or... Um, I can share. So, um, 10 years ago, this conference, I was an emerging artist. So, it was in 2007. And I gave my emerging artist speech, which was like terrifying. Um, the almost to the day, my son's first birthday was the day before I gave the talk. So, I'm sitting there getting ready to go, and I'm like, I did natural childbirth a year ago. I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> And um, the other funny thing is I had my child there with me and he was still nursing and I was getting ready to go and we're in the hotel room and I had a striped shirt on and my husband's like, you better like nurse that one boob. It's like the shirt's going like, <laughs> like this and there's going to be a lot of people up there looking at you. Awesome. <laughs> so I was like, got it. I'll take care of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I guess you find yeah you find a way to to do it and to make it work. And I I taught at Aramont when our when our first was ten months old. And so you know you know about this way ahead of time. Like oh yeah he'll be ten months by then. I'll like have this down. And then suddenly it's there. So I had planned starting you know six months prior. I pumped and stored enough breast milk in the to have in our freezer so that he could have that while I was gone. And then I had to pump the entire time I was teaching at Aramont. And I calculated that I pumped the equivalent to a case of beer <laughs> that I um, trucked back home and on dry ice so that he could have it. So it's a great measurement standard. Yeah, I think that was I'm like, wow, everyone else has been drinking their beer. And I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So oh. before we close the question and answer portion of our panel, um, I would love to hear any advice or words of wisdom that mm -hmm. you guys have to share. Hmm. Well, not everybody has, this is always easier with a good partner um, that has good communication and can support you, which I do. Thank you, Tyler. Um, <laughs> um, another thing, though, we've had to navigate it is not just my studio time, is his studio time. And sometimes I can feel guilty, not that I'm getting studio, but I know he's having a show coming up. So that's another thing. Uh, we do live in a place where we have no family around, and I think having family around can be really helpful. Um, just for, just, I can't tell you how many times. So, uh, if you can live in a place where you have a good relationship with your family and they can help you, that's great. Luckily, I've got a chosen family of friends that are wonderful. So, um, and just know that they're going to be. Um, really hard parts, and I think it's hardest at the beginning when it's most time demanding, um, but it changes. It doesn't always get easier. The challenges are different, but, you know, yeah. you can do it. Uh, yeah, you can't. I was going to say, that's just, it's going to be so individual, and you'll figure out a way that works for you and your family, and it's so specific to all of your, you know, your situation and whether or not you have family. We live in an area where we don't have any family support, so we've done the same thing where we've built the support of of the friends around us to, um, to rely on and help each other. Um, and then I would also just say, try not to beat yourself up over it. Like the kind of parent that I thought I was gonna be before becoming a parent is nothing like the parent that I actually am. And for the first year of, of being a parent, I felt like I kept trying to make myself be this parent that I thought I had to be. And, and so allow yourself that sort of flexibility to, 
to kind of maneuver and, and the grace to sort of figure out what does work for you and what does work for your family and just, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really great that you touched on like, you know, that the kind of parent you thought you were going to be and the kind of parent that you are because um, whether you came here today seeking how to balance your career and your family, um, I think we're, we're all just here, you know, in pursuit of happiness and finding that balance that works for you. Um, so through creating this talk, um, we're hoping to build a sense of community so that people like Katie and I um, have resources like Aaron and Megan to reach out to and be like, how did you do this? Um, you know, so it's a, it's a support system. Uh, it's, that we're trying to It's to important create. to find role models. So, um, and I think this conversation is really going on a lot of places right now. Uh, Kate Fisher just wrote an article on parenting and mothering and it's uh, online completely through Studio Potter. Studio Potter is completely dedicated to women this issue and there's another fantastic interview where you can hear the voice of, voices of three very prolific um, uh, potters Leanne McClure, um, Carrie Radish, and Elizabeth Robinson. And so they have a whole inter interview on this exact topic. And they talked about role models. And it was we all came up in academia. And there were a lot of uh, male role models. And um, a number of them didn't have kids. But then I happened to just be working under Liz Quackenbush at Penn State, who had a kid while I was there. And I worked in her studio as a studio assistant. So I saw her go through all this and her struggles. And we talked about it. It wasn't anything. I thought it was like, oh, this is just how it is. So I was lucky to have that role model. And that article that she's referencing um, from Kate Fisher and Studio Potter, you can find on our Facebook page. Um, and we'll try to post different opportunities and things like that on that page as well. So it, it really can be a resource as well as a place for community and to even ask out about particular um, topics that we may be struggling with in this mm -hmm. community. Um, we have about eight to ten minutes left. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor now, if you can please come to the microphone um, to hear any questions that you guys have from the audience here. Thanks, we got a brave soul going first. We appreciate it. <laughs> you may not think so after I ask my question. <laughs> um, so I, I feel that this really is a panel about being a mother artist, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what you all have to say about well, if you feel the challenges are the same for father artists as they are for mother artists. I can comment immediately on that, that part of our development for this panel uh, was setting up a survey that we tried to send out to different artist parents. Um, I can't, as with an anonymous survey, I can't guarantee, um, I actually we did know whether it was a mother or father in their information. And we probably got a stronger response from mothers, but there's fathers that we heard from in this as well. And the biggest overarching theme that we were hearing people wanted to discuss um, across both mothers and fathers um, were those issues of guilt and those issues of finances. I remember reading of a, a father speaking about this huge gap in their finances. Um, and even as a man to be struggling with, making less money when a lot of times the men are the breadwinner. And obviously our perspective is from women, but that's definitely some topics that we saw across both fathers and mothers going into this project. I would like to say that I don't think it is completely equal though. There's much more questions asked to a woman. If a woman is working with a gallery and she becomes pregnant, the gallery may they like, oh, what's going to happen with this reputation, you know, the work, how's it going to change? Are they going to hold up their end of the deal? There's going to be pressure and hesitation when if it's a man and a man happens to mention that he's going to become a father, there's really not that same sort of apprehension. And even if you try to share domestic duties as much as you can, it is often not as equal. Um, luckily, my husband loves to cook and is really great, so that's a, a big burden that often falls to the female that I don't deal with. Um, but still, I feel like there's some things that are a little some different. And uh, I feel like it would have been good to have a dad up here. And I do want to say that there are a lot of fathers out there actually discussing this. And um, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that this exact conversation happened with all 
dads, yep. and it's going to be on Tales of the Red Clay Rambler, the podcast. Yeah. So we could maybe hear Compare that notes. and do some yeah. <laughs> comparisons. So. Thank you for putting this panel together, by the way. This has been awesome. Thank you for uh, coming. Yes. You're welcome. Um, I have three kids, uh, boy, girl, twins that are 14, and then I have a 12-year-old. And so they right now are into their own competitive, you know, one's soccer, one is, um, you know, swims and that sort of a thing. And so I am finding myself trying to use their time at practice or at their games or their matches or whatever they're into, trying to maximize my time there. Um, other than just preliminary sketches or doing things online, do you have any advice for for that? So, so you are at the location. I'm at the location, uh -huh. but I can't bring my clay with me. Mm, yeah. You know, I, so find, I don't know your work. Look online, but like if I was doing something like that and yeah. I was going to a place, I would take something in a small tote and sometimes carve it or do something that doesn't require. Okay building so maybe there's something that you've been wanting to try and you haven't and it doesn't really um, so you just do what you can so the one piece that comes up of this yeah. um, the next one coming up where there's all the carving on the top I did that a, a lot of the I did <laughs> I did the wax resist for the intense glazing in a van um, driving down the road, go, I do these races, and it was a, a long distance race, and there was a six hour car ride. So I brought stuff with me, and I worked in the car. So Perfect. you just yeah. like, just <laughs> you say, oh, I can't do it there, but you actually can. Okay, thank you. I needed to hear that. Good. <laughs> or you might be able to, um, kind of like Erin said, that she switches with other parents. You know, if there's another parent where maybe you're not there. Carpool. Every time you carpool, and even if you, if one day, I know, but like, oh, yeah, yeah the game, but pra yeah. yeah, but you know, yeah. maybe you miss a practice here and there. Yeah, yeah, game. Hi, um, I'd like to hear you a little on uh, residencies and with and without the kids, just uh, how you get organized with that. Okay. You, go ahead. Sure. Um, so I did residencies when I was pregnant with both boys. Um, I did a, a one-month residency at uh, Clay Studio of Missoula when I was about six or seven months pregnant with our first. Um, and we, we just timed it. At that point, we didn't have any children, so it was very easy because every, you know, the kid is right here and I can just take them with me. I didn't feel great, but I was able to, we made arrangements so that I could go and, and, and do that residency. Um, it was also short, short term. I feel like at this point in my life and at this phase of my career, I'm sort of limited to four, two to four weeks. Um, and then I did a two-week uh, residency with other mothers at Watershed when I was about seven months pregnant with our second. And I did the exact same thing. I didn't yeah. even know that. It was, I was seven months pregnant and I was at Watershed. <laughs> Doing a residency right before you have a child can it's be a great. great thing because you can really just say, I'm just going to indulge this side of me because I know it's going to change a lot. Um, and one other little tip that I forgot to mention is uh, doing a lot of making before you have a baby so there are things to glaze like I personally didn't do much glazing while I was pregnant and so when I um, had the child I was like okay I have to finish these things I have to glaze them now that was a good thing to do yeah. um, and the other thing with the residency I went to the Archie Bray um, and my husband and I both went at the same time. We put in two separate applications independent of each other because I didn't want, I wanted to get in on my own. I didn't want it to be this conversation about us coming as a couple. We both got in and then we said, hey, we want to um, just have one space. And he worked seven weeks. I worked seven weeks. We didn't do like back, back and forth navigating. It was like full on for each of us and then the other person. So um, if you can go to a residency with somebody else, it can help. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yep. He was, I had one child then and he was 18 months old. Yep, and we just, it was hard to find a place to rent that I kind of like, you know, I mean, there was, there was challenges, but, but it was, it was fine. Yep. 
And with that, uh, we'd like to thank all of you guys for coming. It's now time for us to wrap up, but we so appreciate um, you showing up and being a part of the conversation. Come up and ask yeah, that come, question yeah, as we clean up. If yeah. you have questions, we'd <laughs> yeah. be happy to talk to you. I'm so yeah. sorry. We'd be happy to help you up here. Come on, come on. Come on. We yeah. don't bite. Come on up. Yeah. I, can, I, can I have this on? I just want to say that I am so impressed by these two ladies that it, like, you're 24, that you're thinking ahead and you're that organized. Like, I'm the big 40-year-old grown-up, okay, 41, and I was like, I'm not going to organize and get that panel together even though I want to have it. So I want to say that they did a fantastic job and a lot of the legwork. Thank you.